Yeah, we're talking about fasting, and it's the last of a three-part series. And I've never, ever preached three, a three-part series on fasting before. This, this is, um, I've only ever preached once, or maybe I've done prayer and fasting. But this is the first time I've done three weeks on fasting. And I really believe it's because God wants to get our attention. And he really does want us to, as a church, to, to really seek him to seek him afresh, to get some fresh revelation from, from him. And we, the first week we talked about the fact that, like any principle, like reading your Bible it, it, uh, or praying or coming to church, it's not about doing something because we have to. It's about relationship. It, it's all about everything we do as a Christian should come out of relationship that we have with the Father because of what Jesus has done for us. Everything we do. So it's not, we're not doing it because we've got some sort of demanding Father who expects us to do it. And if, we're, if we don't, we're in trouble. We're doing it because we've got a loving Father who we just want to get close to. And we'll do anything we can to get close to our loving Father. Um, and then last week we talked about what prayer and fasting does for us personally. What it can change within us is it disconnects us from, from the world and it, it connects us to him. And fasting, we said, was something where normally you, you give up food for a period of time or you give up some kinds of food for a period of time. But it also includes other kinds of fasting as, uh, as well, and, and also partial fasts and so on. And um, at, at the end of next week, we'll actually give out some um, leaflets that you can take home. They'll be at the back. They'll be available for you to read. It just helps you a guide to how you can um, fast successfully. So they'll be given out next week. So fasting... It's not something that makes you right with God. He makes us right with God. It's not something that forces his hand. God can do what he wants. It doesn't manipulate God. Fasting actually brings us in line with God's will. And when we're in, li in line with God's will, we see real power. Real power is released. Uh, and I want to talk about that today. The heavenly shifts that occur when we fast. What happens around us? Because fasting releases something and changes things in heaven, in the heavenlies. We, it, it's an, it's a, something we don't talk about because we don't see it much. But all around us are, are spiritual forces, and fasting changes what's going on up there. Fasting and prayer. And what's going on up there or around us affects what's going on in our situations. It affects what's going on on earth. And we see that a number of times. And fasting really is one of the ways in which God gives us the privilege of being a part in what he's doing. He doesn't need us to do it. You know, God didn't need Adam and Eve to take care of the land. He didn't need them to, he, he'd spoken the, the earth into existence. He could look after it himself, but he gave Adam and Eve the privilege of stewarding, of sowing, of reaping. He gave them the privilege. We have the privilege of being able to move things in heaven. And it's a real privilege. Um, I mentioned um, Jensen Franklin last week. Um, see, he talks a lot about fasting. One of the things he says is this, that our act of obedience releases God's blessing and power in heaven. And you see that no more than in the, um, in the story of Moses and Joshua. When Moses was praying on the mountainside and Joshua was out fighting a battle. And it says there that when Moses had his hands lifted before God in prayer... Joshua was winning the battle. When Moses' arms started to tire, Joshua was losing the battle. And it's a, it's a really strange thing because does God really need Moses' hands to be lifted in the air in order to win a battle? No, of course he doesn't. But Moses' act of obedience 
released the power, the blessing of God. Moses' act of obedience. God gave Moses the privilege of being part of his plan, of being part of what he wanted to do that day. As Moses lifted his hands in prayer, power was released behind Joshua. Things were changed in the heavenlies that changed things on earth. Now, it doesn't make God love us more. It doesn't force his love is without limitations. It doesn't force anything, but it releases the favor, power, and blessing of God when we steward what God has given us. And fasting is one of those acts that just releases God's power and God's blessing. And I want to today talk about just some of the changes that were made, testimonies, if you like, from the Bible of the kind of changes that happened when people fasted. But let's just go back to Daniel 10 for a second, because in Daniel 10, which we read last week, we see what's going on in the heavenlies. It's just a glimpse. We don't get many glimpses into the heavenlies, but we do here in Daniel chapter 10. And Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 to 14, says this. And it's when, um, it's when the, 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 the person has come to meet with Daniel. And he says these words. And he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Remember, fasting was a way of humbling himself before God. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. It's amazing insight into the heavenly battle that was going on. Daniel fasted and prayed. The moment he started to fast and pray... The answer to Daniel's prayer was coming. But there was a battle that went on between, um, it calls calls him the prince of of Persia, the king. And and it was a a co-name, if you like, for one of the the forces of the enemy that came to oppose God's will. And there was a battle going on in the heavenlies. And as that was going on, Daniel had no idea. He was simply asking God. He was simply fasting, humbling himself, and praying before God, having no idea of what was going on in the heavenlies around him, wondering why God wasn't answering his prayer straight away. And then at the end of those 21 days, he, he has this awesome vision of this, of this man who's, who's just glorious and is like lightning, comes before Daniel and says, Look, while you were doing that, There was a battle going on. There was a connection between what Daniel was doing on earth and the battle that was going on in the heavenlies. And actually, I mentioned the other night on the prayer meeting that I've been reading through Revelation in my personal devotion time. And I got to Revelation chapter 12, and it's something that I've read many times, but I saw something in there that I hadn't noticed before. And it's the part where... Michael, who, who was mentioned here, one of the um, angels of God, was fi- him and the angels in heaven. It's, a, it's another very similar scene to here. When he's fighting against, um, he's called the dragon, he's later identified as Satan. He's fighting against Satan's forces in heaven. And he overcomes and Satan is thrown down. And you see that battle in heaven. But in the next few verses, it then says that the saints on earth... God's people on earth overcame the devil through the, the word of their testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So actually, it talks about the great battle going on in heaven that, that Michael won, but then it goes on to talk about the fact that the battle was won on earth with the, with the, the saints through the, the word of testimony and the blood of the Lamb. 
So that battle that was going on was directly affected by what was going on on earth. Daniel, uh, Re Revelation 12 gives both Michael and the angels and the saints on earth, it gives them both credit for, for that victory that was won. See, it's, it's connected. What went on on earth affected heaven, and what went on in heaven affected earth. And this may seem strange, it may, it may seem nonsensical, but I've seen too many times in my own personal life prayer that has changed situations in heaven, that has changed things on earth. I've seen it to be true. I want to look at just a few different things that fasting, when people were called together to fast, the things it changed on earth. Uh, I just want to mention a few of the things. We'll put the next slide up. The things that, that fasting changed, the shifts that happened in heaven that affected earth. It, it brought freedom and victory. It brought safety and peace. Impossible situations were, were transformed and turned around. It brought repentance uh, and mercy, and it brought direction and power. I'm not going to speak about the repentance and mercy, because we spoke more about the, the personal change last week. But I want to I talk about those other four um, stories that we read in the Bible that shows the power of fasting. And I want to use that as a bit of an encouragement to us. I don't believe there... Um, a list that, that is the, the full extent of what fasting can change and what fasting can bring. I believe these are, are testimonies to show the kind of power that fasting and prayer releases. The kind of shifts that we can expect to see when we seek God, when we humble ourselves before Him, when we, when we disconnect from the world and when we connect to Him, the kind of spiritual shifts that can take Place. I want to look at the first one of those, freedom and victory. And it's, it's found in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 2 to 4. 2 Chronicles 20, 2 to 4. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a fast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So Jehoshaphat, for those who don't know, Jehosh Jehoshaphat was a king that, that ruled over the south part of Israel, the place called Judah. He, he reigned over that place, and all the people of Judah were, were, um, would worship God and were worshippers of the Lord. They were Jews. And around, the nations around all grouped together to come against this small nation and to overpower them, to overcome this nation and to take them into captivity. And Jehoshaphat was the king. And he saw that he, he stood no chance. In the physical, this, this opposition was far too great for him. His army was not big enough. His power was not there. He could not possibly overcome the armies that, that stood against him. The battle was too big. The opposition was too strong. Have you ever been in a position in life where you just stand and look around at all you're facing and think, this battle's too big for me? There's nothing that I can do in my own strength that's going to shift, that's going to bring any change. It's too much for me. That was what Jehoshaphat faced. And he recognizes that. And so he, he calls everybody together for fasting and prayer. All the people of Judah come together. He reminds himself, he reminds the people around him, he reminds God of the promises. And it's in that atmosphere of prayer that the Holy Spirit comes on somebody and that person stands up and he says, amongst other things, he says these words. And it's in verse 15. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. 
I'll read on in a second, but he's saying, do not be afraid of this vast army. So he doesn't belittle how big this army is. But he says, do not be afraid. Because he goes on to say, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Can you see the shift that has taken place just in that one statement? Jehoshaphat is the king. It's his duty, to go, for, for those that were listening a, a few weeks ago, I talked about the duties of a king. It was his duty to protect the nation. That was his duty as king. But when he became before God, when he humbled himself before God in fasting and prayer, the shift that took place is that burden was taken off his shoulders and onto God's shoulders. It was not his battle to face. It was God's battle to face. You know, when, when we come before God in humility, in fasting and prayer, that's one of the things that happens. The burden is taken off our puny shoulders, our incapable shoulders, and it's put on the, the broad, capable shoulders of God. That problem, that opposition, whatever it is for you, it may be that you're just faced with so many relationship struggles around you that you don't know how to, how to cope with it. You don't know how you're going to get through this next period. It may be that ill health is just attacking you and your family from every side, and you think, Lord, I can't get through this. It may be your job situation. It may be a combination of all these things that think, Lord, I cannot get through this. And, and you're trying in your own strength to get through it. And you're carrying a burden that you know you cannot bear. Fasting and prayer creates a shift. Because it takes the burden off your shoulders. And places it on God's. So much so that when Jehoshaphat got this message. When he got it into, it, when he got it into his heart. Because it's got to get into your heart. He knew, yeah, that God is powerful, but when it really got there, after this time of fasting and prayer, not only did he go out into battle, but he actually sent the worship leaders first. Maybe he didn't like them, I don't know. But he sent, the, <laughs> he sent them before the army. There's probably a few people who, no, I won't, I won't say that. There's, um, but he, he sent them first. And when they got there, when they got to the battlefield, what they actually discovered is the enemy, because they were from different nations, they turned on themselves. They started before, um, before it even got to the battlefield, they'd fought each other and were defeated. And Jehoshaphat just turned up and, and saw the fields around him of the enemy lying about and just picked up the plunder and walked off home with the plunder. That's the story of what happened. He got freedom and victory because of fasting and prayer. What an awesome testimony. I want to just let that, just let that wash over you now. Because, you know, if you're going to be motivated to fast, you need some reason. <laughs> let that just speak to you now. Just think about the opposition you're facing right now. That opposition that seems too much for you. That burden that you're carrying that is too heavy for your shoulders. And just think about what it would feel like if that burden was no longer on your shoulders and was now sitting squarely on the shoulders of somebody who is more than capable of carrying it and can change the whole situation around. Let's move on to the next example, safety and peace. We're going to read from Ezra, chapter 8, 21 to 23. There, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God, and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions, I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies of the Lord because we had told the king, 
The gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. Do we believe that God is great? Do we believe that God is able to heal? Do we believe that if God sends us into something, he will, he will, he will bring us through? Do we believe that um, if, if God asks us to do something, he will equip us for it? We believe that, don't we? But if you ever got to the point where you believe something and God asks you to do it, I think, oh, oh, oh Lord. <laughs> yeah, well, hold on a second. That's what Ezra faced. Ezra, I'll just give you a little bit of history into in Ezra's situation. He was somebody who was living in a foreign country. He was a Jew, but he wasn't living in Israel. Years before, they'd been taken captive, and they were living in a foreign country. Ezra clearly had, had worked himself up to a high position. Uh, and by the grace of God, they were now allowed to go back to Jerusalem. And so Ezra was, was about to lead a whole group of people from captivity to Jerusalem. And it was a wonderful thing. It was absolutely marvelous. The only problem is that journey from their place to Jerusalem meant passing through a lot of countries and a lot of peoples that didn't like them and would attack them without any thought. It was a dangerous journey to have to take. And Ezra has clearly been speaking to the king about how his God is awesome, how his God is wonderful, how his God is the best God, he's the real God, he's the only God. He's been talking about, Ezra's at, the, at this point, he's never had, actually had to live out his faith. He's never had to do anything that was scary. And you know, when we're in our comfort zones, and even though he's in captivity, he's in a comfortable place. When we're in our comfort zones, we can often talk about God. We can often look to others and, and, you know, the amount of people I've had say, oh yeah, the church ought to be doing this or ought to be doing that. Great. I believe you're the person to lead that. Whoa! Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. Ezra had talked the talk in faith, in believing with a good heart. But now he had to walk the walk. And so what did he do? He couldn't say to the king, my God is awesome. My God is able to, to, to protect me. My God is able to keep me. My God will not let anything happen. But just in case he has a day off, can you send some soldiers with us? He knew he was going to have to walk what he'd always believed. And for the faith and courage to do that, he fasted and prayed. The end of that story is they got safely to their destination. And I believe, again, I believe this is prophetic. We've heard when Gwenda spoke a while ago, she spoke about the prophetic power of testimony. And I believe... In this testimony, this, this power, God is calling some of you to, to step out, to stop talking about God and what he can do. Not to stop talking about God, but to stop only talking about God and to step out into a place that is going to scare you. To actually take the responsibility to, to lead others. Not to tell others what to do, but to lead others into a God-given destiny. And God is saying, I'm calling you to do it. I'm equipping you to do it. I'll protect you. I will keep you safe. What fasting and prayer did is give Ezra the, the courage and the trust in God that kept him safe in that journey. It caused a shift to take place. That Ezra didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. And I believe God has called, he's, he's putting that on some of you here to say it's time for some action. I've equipped you. 
Fasting and prayer is the best way to start that journey. Every time God was calling us to do something scary, and I've always said, I believe God, that I'll, do, you know, I'll do this, I'll do the other, I'll do the other for you, God. And God says, go then. Oh, oh. And it's often been through a time of fasting and prayer that's just centered me in that, in that trust in God that I've been able to boldly take that step that God has been calling me to do. And sometimes they've been really scary steps. But it's through, been through a time of fasting and prayer that God has given me the courage to do that. And even when the hard times come and you see the enemy around you, you think, oh no, you know that you know that you know. <clears throat> but safety and peace so that Ezra could walk in the walk that he'd been called to do. Let's read the next one. Impossible situations to be transformed. Esther 4, 15 to 16. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther, um, like Ezra before her, or after her, was somebody who had been taken into captivity. So she was somebody who had would, who would been taken and, uh, and was living in this foreign land. But through the grace of God, she'd actually been able to marry up to the king. So she was, she was a Jew, but she was married to the king uh, of, of the, the territory. And, and she, was, she had that power and influence that, that came with being a queen. But it, doesn't, it wasn't quite like we see kings and queens nowadays. The king had ultimate power. And for anybody, even the queen, to come into his presence uninvited... Was, was the death penalty. It's like when, when Jason is watching Liverpool on the TV and if anybody comes into his presence uninvited, it's a death penalty, isn't it, Jace? Especially this year when you're actually doing something. You know. And Esther... <laughs> but there was... At that time, Esther was the queen. The king's right-hand man called Haman, he was working against, and he'd plotted to kill all of the Jews of that area. He'd plotted to kill, he, he'd worked behind, the, he'd set a trap for them. He'd set a trap that was, that was going to destroy the, the, the Jews. And Esther was told by her friend Mordecai, well, you've got to do something, and she was scared, and Mordecai said, look, You've got to do something or else everybody will die. And you with them. And so Esther was faced with a choice. She either risks death by going in front of the king and dying then and there on the spot, humiliated. Or she could risk doing nothing and dying that way. It was a pretty stark choice. It was an impossible situation. My, my son, like, I, I, won't, I won't play with him, but he likes to play this mental game of would you rather. And it's always these negative stuff. He said, Dad, would you rather lose an arm or a leg? I don't want to play that, Noah. Dad, would you rather be blind or deaf? It's always negative. I don't want to play that game, Noah. And, and Esther, this one of these, the, you know, the enemy had given Esther one of these would you rather situations. Would you rather die here or there? Would you rather the frying pan or the fryer? Take your pick. She'd go in one of those impossible situations. Have you ever been in one of those impossible situations when you feel, I'm walking into this and whatever I do now is going to be wrong. Whatever I do, I'm going to end up the bad guy. I'm going to end up, it's going to go bad. It's going to go horrible. 
There's nothing I can do in this situation that's going to be good. Es Esther was facing one of those situations. And so she calls everybody to fast and pray. There seems no possible way that this situation can end up good. But she, she calls everybody to a time of fasting and prayer. And as that happens, something again changes in the heavenlies. And that trap we find, if we read the story of Esther, and it's a wonderful story. If you read the story of Esther, that trap that was sent by Haman, the trap that he'd set to actually kill Esther's closest relative, was a trap that he actually ended up falling into himself. Fasting and prayer actually turned the trap of the enemy on himself. It turned all the plans of the enemy around on himself. It was through fasting and prayer, through seeking God in that situation, that the whole situation was turned upside down. That was, imp that was impossible suddenly became possible. I think some of you are facing situations coming into this new year where you just feel, I can't do anything that's going to be right in this situation. There doesn't seem to be any good solution. And I just want to encourage you to just become before God in fasting and prayer. To seek him. Because you'll be surprised at what God can turn around. I mean, if you read that story, the way that it happens is not the way you might, might expect. But God turns the situation around. Fasting and prayer has the power to change and transform any situation, any trap of the enemy that just seems an impossible um, an impossible task for you to face. Through fasting and prayer, that whole situation can be transformed and turned around. And the traps that the enemy is trying to set for you can be turned on himself. I'll just quickly testify about that one. When I was in the police force, at one point, I had to make a stand for my faith. And it was a, it was a very, very difficult period. And I ended up... Um, having to go into interviews with higher and higher ranked people. And I can remember one, one day, and I'd got an interview, it was going to be in the next half an hour, when I was going to be interviewed, and I could risk losing my job over this. I had to make this stand, I'm not going into it now, it's a, full, it's a long story. But I had to make a stand on behalf of my faith. And in that room, there was going to be a chief inspector, a superintendent, and there was going to be two people... Um, from an outside organization that were making allegations against me. And I, I, was, I was scared. And I was sitting in my office, and I, the church were praying for me at the time because they knew about the situation, and we'd sought God together, and people were fasting and praying for me. And, and as I was sitting there, it was pouring down with rain, and we were in a top security. Uh, I was working in the headquarters. It was a, top, it was a brand new building, top security. And as I was sitting there praying, Lord, I, I need you to do something this, in this situation. A bolt of lightning, as I was praying that prayer, and God's never answered a prayer quite this dramatically since. A bolt of lightning hit the building. And as that bolt of lightning hit, it, all the doors in this building suddenly became unlocked. It was, you needed a car to get, get in every single door. And your car would only get you in certain parts of the building. It was all, it was all, um, it was top, top of the um, state of the art technology at that time. And all of a sudden, this bolt of lightning hit, and every door, you could, you could go and get the arms if you wanted, you could get the guns out of, you could, you could go anywhere. The whole place opened up, and I just felt it, and I, the bolt lightning hit, I could hear people saying what had happened, that it was now completely unlocked. And I just felt God say to me, just in the spirit, nobody can tell you where to go and where not to go except for me. And I just felt a peace come on me. That when I went into that interview, there was a trap set for me. Um, they were pur purposely leading the conversation a particular way, these, this outside organization. And I just, I just felt the Spirit of God stir within me, and I just gave answers so calmly because God, I could feel the peace of God with me. And in the end, the person who was trying to accuse me got so angry because he wasn't able to set the trap that the chief superintendent actually had to tell him 
to calm down or to leave. Because God had just switched the whole situation on its head. He just changed it. That, that trap that was set for me was just completely turned on its head. That impossible situation. The final thing I want to say is that a testimony of when God gives direction and, and power. Let's read Acts 13 verses 1 to 3. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, um, Lucius, and Manaean, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. So at that time, the church in Antioch was probably the second most important church in the whole area. After Jerusalem, this was becoming the center of the church at that time. It was the center of Christianity. And certainly the mission center for the church was in Antioch. And it would have been the most successful church at that time. And the, to be on a leadership there would have been wonderful. And they were all praying together, all these leaders who were gifted teachers, prophets, pastors, evangelists, apostles. They were, they were praying together. They were seeking God. They were fasting. And God spoke to them. And God said, take Paul, or Saul as he was called at that point, take Paul and Barnabas. And I want you to send them out onto the mission field. The whole church were brought together in unity for a decision that they would have not have wanted. They, the church would not have wanted to lose two of their most prominent and gifted leaders at that time. You know, the church was growing. It was, it was a sense they probably would have thought, let's, let's keep all of them here. You know, these are our, these are our leaders. These are our, uh, our great teachers amongst us. But they heard God's voice. And so they sent out Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas probably were a little bit worried about the journey that was ahead of them. It would not have been an ease to leave that comfort zone of Antioch, the place where you're surrounded by a growing and thriving church, would not have been an easy decision. But they clearly, as a group, in a time of fasting and prayer, heard God's voice. And what a decision that was. Paul and Barnabas. I mean, obviously we know about Paul, but even Barnabas um, was instrumental in so many churches being, being set up, especially when, when he, even when they had a fallout, him and Paul. He went off and set up more churches up. Paul became the greatest missionary we've ever seen in the Christian church and brought the, the Christianity to Europe. And it all happened when the church were united in a time of fasting and prayer. They, they, when, you, when you read what happens after this, they, they're sent out not just with the direction of God, but with the power of God. You see the miracles that happen to them just one after one after, after another after, after they had this time of fasting and prayer. It gave them direction. And power. If we're going to make a difference, if we're going to leave our comfort zones, and when the going gets tough, stay outside of our comfort zones, because it's one thing to step outside your comfort zone, and then you realize it's not so comfortable, I'll step back. If we're going to step outside and stay outside of our comfort zones, we need to know that God is behind it. We need to know it's His will. And when we do that, the difference that he can make. The difference he can make in Biddulph, in Stoke-on-Trent, and across this region is incredible. I'd love, for, after this time of fasting and prayer, for God to say to us, I want you to send this person out or that person out. You know, some of your most important leaders, let's send them.
What happens in heaven affects earth. What happens on earth affects heaven. When we do something in obedience before God, a physical act of obedience to God, power and blessing is released from heaven. A a shift takes place. Freedom and victory. Safety for the plans of God. The ability to foil the enemy when everything seems impossible. Direction and power. That, that, that group, all, all the ones I've just mentioned were times of group fasting when they did it together. And it unified them under a course. It was accompanied by action. It shifted something in heaven and that, then that shifted something on earth. And that's why I want to encourage us all just to have a time. It's not compulsory. Nobody, nobody's going to ask you if you're doing it. You know, it doesn't make you right with God. But I believe God has given us the privilege of doing something on earth that's going to shift something in heaven. And when that shifts in heaven, it's going to change something on earth. God is giving us the privilege of being a part of that. And that's why I want to encourage you to join us in this time of fasting. Can we just bow our heads in prayer? I just want to, before I finish, just give anybody the opportunity who doesn't know Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. If there's anybody here that's never given their life to Jesus, Jesus Christ, you see the cross up up there, Jesus Christ came as a baby. We're going to be celebrating that in a couple of weeks' time. He came as a baby. But he didn't just come for his own sake. He came so that he would take on himself the, the sin and the, the destruction that, that we cause because of our own sinfulness. He, he took the punishment for that on the cross. That anybody that will turn to him and believe in him will also have the victory that he had after the cross when he rose again and he was given and he, he gained new life resurrected life after the cross that is the promise for all those who will turn and believe on jesus christ who will call him lord and savior i want to ask if there's anybody in this room who's not done that who wants to do that this morning just to raise your hand so that i can see it that i can just pray with you afterwards and just tell you a little bit more about what it means to be a follower of jesus christ if there's anybody who's not done that who wants to do that then just raise your hands that i can see it